We live on a water world. But the water we see all around us is not just pure water. Take the oceans, for example. You're probably already aware that ocean water contains a lot of dissolved salts, mostly sodium chloride. In fact, the concentration is quite high, more than half molar. Now, it turns out that when you dissolve a solute in a solvent like water, the solute has some peculiar effects on the behavior of the solvent. We call these effects colligative properties. Why? Because the word colligative implies that the properties are a function of the concentration of the solute and, more specifically, of solute particles. Now, what do we mean by particles in this context? Well, individual molecules count as particles, and individual ions count as separate particles as well. For example, if we dissolve sugar in water, each individual sucrose molecule counts as one particle. But, if we dissolve sodium chloride in water, as you know, the compound separates, we say dissociates, into its individual sodium and chloride ions. Each ion counts as one particle. And this is one feature of colligative properties that can trip you up if you're not careful. For example, if we make a solution containing one mole of sucrose, the number of dissolved particles is one mole. But, if we make a solution containing one mole of sodium chloride, the number of dissolved particles is two moles. One mole of sodium ions and one mole of chloride ions. Get it? Well, what we'd like to do today is take a look at some of these so-called colligative properties and how they are affected by the concentration of particles in the solution. Oh, and by the way, while we will be concentrating in these examples on aqueous solutions, in which water is the solvent, these principles hold true for any solution, no matter what the solvent is. So just keep that in mind. The first colligative property we'll look at is called vapor pressure lowering. You'll recall that any liquid has a so-called equilibrium vapor pressure. That's the pressure exerted by molecules of the liquid, which have vaporized above the liquid in a closed container at equilibrium and that at equilibrium wording is really important. It means that the liquid has been in the closed container long enough that the rate of vaporization equals the rate of condensation. Well, it turns out that when you dissolve a solute in a liquid, it causes the value of this vapor pressure to go down. And the amount by which the vapor pressure decreases is predicted by a simple law called Rayolds Law. Rayolds' law is a really easy one to remember when you consider the rationale behind it. So let's try to create a mental picture of what's happening, and then I'll show you the law. Consider how a liquid evaporates. Molecules in the liquid are in constant motion. Some molecules have enough energy to jump up into the gas phase, and this they must do from the surface or near the surface of the liquid, right? Otherwise, if they were deep in the liquid, they would just bump into molecules above them and stay in the liquid. But, if you add a solute to the liquid, that reduces the population of solvent molecules near the surface which can evaporate. Part of the surface of the solution is occupied by solute molecules. Hence, there are fewer solvent molecules in the gas phase, and the vapor pressure is lower. Now, it turns out that there's another, less important effect at work here also. If a solute dissolves in the liquid, that means there must be a fairly strong attraction between solute and solvent molecules. Otherwise, the solute wouldn't dissolve, right? And if so, that means that solvent molecules may be more strongly attracted in the liquid phase than ever. So they find it harder to escape into the gas phase. Again, this can cause the vapor pressure to drop. But the more important factor in affecting vapor pressure is just the relative population of solvent and solute molecules in the mixture. Okay, do you have a fairly good mental picture of what's happening when we add a solute to a liquid? Good. Now, with that picture in mind, here's Rayold's law. The vapor pressure of the solvent in a solution 
equals the vapor pressure of the pure solvent multiplied by a fraction x which reduces its size. And that fraction is in fact the mole fraction of solvent molecules in the solution. So what does this have to do with our mental picture then? Well think about it. The mole fraction of solvent molecules will be the same as the fraction of molecules on the surface of the mixture which are solvent molecules. The rest are solute molecules. And the number of solvent molecules which are available to escape into the gas phase is now this fraction of 100%. So the vapor pressure should thus be reduced by this same fraction. Now how about a practical example? Take water. At 25 degrees C, the vapor pressure of pure water is 23.8 torr. What if we were to add some methanol to the water? Well, we know that the vapor pressure of the water would go down, right? But by how much? Well, according to our mental picture of what is happening on the microscopic level, it ought to go down in proportion to the fraction of molecules that are water molecules as opposed to methanol. Now let's use Reynolds' law. And let's say that in the solution we have 90% water molecules and 10% methanol molecules. That means that the mole fraction of water is 0.9. And so the vapor pressure of water above this solution would be 0.9 times the vapor pressure of pure water, giving us 21.4 torr. Okay, so far so good. Now for the tricky part. Do you recall that I said at the outset that colligative properties are a function of the concentration not just of a chemical species, but of particles in the solution? What if we were to make a solution of a species which ionized when dissolved? Something like, say, magnesium nitrate. Remember that when a salt like magnesium nitrate dissolves in water, it dissociates into its individual ions, magnesium ions and nitrate ions. Indeed, it forms three ions for every unit of magnesium nitrate that dissolves, doesn't it? So if I were to make a solution that was composed of 0.9 mole water, and 0.1 mole magnesium nitrate, what would be the mole fraction of water then? Well, in terms of particles, it wouldn't be 0.9, would it? That much magnesium nitrate actually produces 0.3 moles of particles. So the mole fraction of water would be 0.9 over 0.9 plus 0.3, or 0.75. And by Reynolds' law, the vapor pressure of the water in this case would be 17.9 torr. Bottom line, if you wanted to reduce the vapor pressure of water, which would be more effective to add at the same amount, methanol or magnesium nitrate? Well, I guess you get the picture. Now, this is the ideal case. That is, if the forces of attraction between solvent and solute molecules is exactly the same as the force of attraction between solvent molecules. If there's a difference, then there will be deviations from Reynolds' law. And that's something you can learn more about from your teacher or from the text. There's another characteristic of liquids which is affected by solute particle concentration, in other words, another colligative property, that I'd like to introduce, and that's called osmotic pressure. This is the pressure that occurs across membranes, like cell membranes, between water solutions of different concentrations. Here's an example. We have a membrane that separates two water phases, one pure water and the other ocean water, which is about half molar sodium chloride. Now this particular membrane allows only water molecules and nothing else to pass through. By experience, we find that without any encouragement at all, water will pass through the membrane from the pure water side into the seawater with a certain pressure. Indeed, if you carry out this experiment in a U-shaped tube like this one, the water column on the seawater side will rise up due to this pressure, and it will keep rising until the force of gravity stops it. There's a formula one can use to predict the size of this pressure, this osmotic pressure and it's easy to derive and remember. It actually can be derived from the ideal gas equation, which I know you know by heart. 
Here's the ideal gas equation. Now let's rearrange it so pressure is alone on one side. Notice on the right-hand side we have N over V as one of the terms. Now for a liquid solution, the number of moles of solute per volume is the molar concentration. So let's substitute molar concentration for N over V. And the pressure on the left now becomes the osmotic pressure, which we symbolize with the Greek letter pi. And this is the formula for osmotic pressure. See how easy that is to derive if you know the ideal gas equation? So no excuses. You shouldn't have any trouble remembering the equation for calculating osmotic pressure. Ah, now, how do we use it? Well, again, the key is to remember that as a colligative property, osmotic pressure requires that we use the concentration of solute particles. So let's say we want to know the osmotic pressure between water and a half molar solution of sodium chloride or seawater. Should we use half molar as the solute concentration in our equation? No. Every mole of sodium chloride produces two moles of ions, one of sodium ions and another of chloride ions. So the concentration of particles in this solution is one molar. And so the calculation of osmotic pressure in this case will look like this. So what about other colligative properties? Let me just mention two others. Freezing point depression and boiling point elevation. Sounds almost like something you'd hear about in a psychology class, doesn't it? <coughs> well, it turns out that when a solute is added to a solvent, the freezing point of the solvent goes down. This is the principle by which antifreeze works in your car. A mixture of water and an organic solute like ethylene glycol freezes at a much lower temperature than does either liquid independently. And it's the principle that melts ice on roads when salt is added in the winter. It's also true that when you add a solute to a liquid, the boiling point of the liquid goes up. It boils at a higher temperature. So boiling seawater will scald you much worse than boiling lake water. No, don't check this out at home. There are actually equations which you can use to predict how much these freezing and boiling temperatures change with the concentration of solute particles. But I'm going to leave it to your teacher to introduce these. Suffice it to say here, that it's important to remember the direction of the two changes. Freezing point gets lower and boiling point gets higher. One way to think of it is to remember the old adage, the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. In other words, the lower temperature gets even lower and the higher temperature gets even higher. <laughs>